Well, hello and welcome back. Um, I'm here again to give a, another problem session uh, because we're not having class live stream this Wednesday. I'm here to give another uh, problem session just recording, uh, this time on section 2.6. Uh, 2.6 is about transformations functions, so we'll be looking at uh, several different graphs, several different, uh, well, several different transformations. And at the end, I'm going to be doing sort of one of the harder problems in terms of determining if a function is odd or even. So we'll, we'll sort of build into it, and I hope it goes well. For me, I, I'm prone to making mistakes in recordings, so here we go. <laughs> we'll get started. Section 2.6, transformations of functions. The first one just asks if you've got some function, f of x, and then you graph this, y equals f of x minus 5 plus 2, it, it asks you to describe the transformation that is occurring. So first off, there, I see two different things happening to our function f. I see 2 has been added to it here, and I see that 5 has been subtracted from x there. So first I'll start with that plus 2, which has been added to the entire function f. This plus 2 vertically shifts the function, and I'm going to say up 2 units. So it just lifts the whole function up. It's, it's been added to f of some input. So whatever, whatever we get there for that output, we just add 2 to it. So it lifts the whole thing up. Okay, the next thing is this internal subtraction by 5. Subtraction by 5, or subtraction by a number on the input before putting it in to the function. This is the same as horizontally shifting. to the right. I described in the video, the lecture video, this is essentially like grabbing our x-axis and moving it to the left. We're taking every, every x number, we're making it smaller, we're moving it to the left. Right? And that has the effect, if we, if we grab the x-axis and pull it over and, and then graph our function, that has the effect of really moving our graph to the right. So this is horizontally shifting right by 5 units. That's part A. Part B, same question. How has the graph of f been transformed? So I'll handle it again in two steps. This minus 1, we're subtracting 1 from every single output. So you plug in an x, you add 1 to it, you plug that into f, you get some output. No matter what it is, you subtract one, and you lower it down one value. So this vertically shifts function down one unit. Okay. Next we'll handle this addition of one. In the opposite way from the previous part, we're increasing the input by 1. We're increasing it this time. So it's like we're taking that x-axis and we're actually pushing it to the right a little bit. You're moving the base first, and then you're building on top of it. And then you have to essentially shift it back. So this has the effect of horizontally shifting the whole thing left. We've moved the x-axis to the right one, so we're, we're actually graphing on the left now. By how much? It's by exactly the amount that is added, so by one. Okay. Next problem is to uh, explain how g is a transformation of f. So f is the square, is, sorry, is the absolute value of x, and g of x is the absolute value of x plus 2 minus 2. So first I'm going to write g of x like this. I'm going to 
I'm going to say, well, it looks kind of like f of x. We've got absolute values of something. So let's write it like this. It's f of that something. Right? Instead of plugging in x, we've plugged in x plus 2. That's fine. So in fact, it's, it's what we get when we just plug in x plus 2 to the function f. And then, what do we do to that output? We just subtract 2 from it. So g of x is, well, you take the function f, and instead of plugging in a number, you add 2 to it first, and then you plug it into f. And then whatever you get out, you subtract 2 from it. So g is a transformation of x. It is a upward, excuse me, downward shift by shift E <laughs> shift by 2 and so that's this and left shift by 2 of F so g is a downward shift by 2 and a left shift of 2 uh, by 2 of the function f. Okay, the hardest part of these problems is rewriting one function in terms of the other, but I think we can see that there. So the same question, uh, how is g a transformation of f? And this one introduces a negative sign. It maybe complicates matters for us, but it's, it's still not too bad. So when I look at the function g, I see a plus 1. So already I'm thinking, oh, we're going to have a vertical shift here, uh, you know, raising it up 1. And then this negative sign, let me, let me say here that if, if g was just this, negative root x, no plus 1, uh, the answer would be that we've flipped f along the x-axis. We've taken every positive height and we've made it a negative height. We've just flipped it entirely across the x-axis. But that's not what we have. We have a plus 1. So now the question is, what's the order? Because it's still a flip and it's still a plus 1. It's still a, you know, a vertical shift and some sort of flipping. The question is, what's the order? Is it flipped first, and then is it raised or lowered? Or is it first raised or lowered, and then flipped? So I'll tease this out a little bit more, just to illustrate it, because this is a more complicated problem. Let's say I took the function f, and I raised it 1. So this is, I take the function f, and I've raised it by 1. So now let me flip it. That means we're going to just take the height that it gave us, we're going to change that to a negative height. We're going to flip it across the x-axis. That would result in negative root x minus 1. So this was first raise, then flip. And that's not what we got. Okay, so we don't have that ordering. So it must be the other ordering, right? Well, let's check. So if we first took f and we flipped it, right? So we do, that's it, negative root x. We take that output and then we raise it by 1, well that's that's no different than just writing it this way, we do get g. Hmm. So g is a reflection across the x-axis 
raised then so maybe right here then raised by one reflection of x of of f sorry across the x-axis then raised by one that's the transformations that took place to accomplish d you, you take the function f you flip it across the x-axis and then you raise the result by one okay not as easy of a problem there's there's some order involved in these reflections there's some order involved in these raisings and shiftings left and right so that's question two no, 22 next one question 51 is uh, to graph this thing <laughs> so we're gonna graph it and it does look mean it does look nasty I entirely agree with you but it's really not gonna take us that long so we all know our our square root function I hope Here we go. I want to do this. We all know our square root function. And how to graph it. So, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I'm trying to be as accurate as possible here because this will maybe help with your understanding so the square root function um, right when you plug in 0 you get 0 when you plug in 1 you get 1 when you plug in 4 you get 2 so it's this slowly slowly growing function that sort of like bends like that this is the square root of X um, that's not what we're graphing here, but this is the parent function. It's sort of the representative of this class of functions that are just this thing transformed. So we're going to piece this through. Um, we're going to look at how this and this and this really just transform this red graph into something else. So the first thing we can do is <clears throat> we can look at you know, again, the ordering of these things. We're going to look at first what this one half does. Then we'll look at the plus four, and then we'll look at the minus three. And the reason we're doing that is because we know that this minus three just means take the output of whatever we get from this thing that's now in parentheses. We're just going to lower it down three. So we're going to just take whatever it is, and we'll lower it down three at the end. So you could do that first, you could do that last, doesn't matter. So what does this one half do? the one half takes all of the heights of the square root function and it compresses them down by a factor of two so before if we got one we get one half before if we got two we get one if we got three we now get three halves at zero we still get zero so this flatter version is one half square root of x right okay so that's done check how about this plus four underneath well that essentially moves our x-axis to the right which means we've moved our entire graph to the left Right? We, we take the x-axis and the y-axis with it and we move it to the right four units and we keep the graphs in place. <laughs> and now what we see is this whole thing is just over here. I should have done that in a different color. Let me retrace over it. In pink, we've just taken every point and we've shifted it to the left four units okay and then the last step 
is just to take that whole thing and drop it down three units. Drop it down three length units. So here we go in blue. One, two, three. One half is here. And then one is there. So I know I didn't quite get this right, but here we go. This is one half square root of x plus 4 minus 3. We shrunk it down by a factor of 1 half, and then we shifted it to the left 4 units, and then we shifted it down 3 units. So this is minus 3, this was the plus 4, and this was the times 1 half. Okay, all those things together give you this final result. And so did I need to make a table of points? No. I just sort of plotted my original function and then I went from there. And you know, you get good enough at things like this and you can just you can just graph them quickly. So maybe I'll do I have another example? I don't. I'll do one at the end, but I'll I'll pull another one out of the book here and I'll just graph it real quickly. Without showing every possibly even step and I'll just explain it as I go through it. So these next two questions, this first one's rather easy, the next one's not so easy. Um <clears throat> we're, we're asking if these questions, if these functions are even or odd. Um, so we need to just algebraically, we could graphically do this too, but algebraically we're going to look at these and see um, if when we plug in negative x, do we get either plus f of x, in which case we say it's even, or do we get minus f, or f of x, in which case we say it's odd, or do we get neither, in which case we say neither. So that's that's the strategy for these kinds of problems. We plug in negative x, we simplify, and we see what we have. So here we go. f of negative x, what is that? It's negative x to the fourth minus four negative x squared. Well, this, this is an even power. This is an even power. So we get negative ones multiplied together an even number of times, which gives us positive results. So this is positive x to the fourth minus four times positive x to the second, which means we have our original function back. Right? This is the same as our original function. So this is an even function. And that should not come as a surprise to anyone because these are even powers. All of the powers are even. There's no mixing of them. They're not all odd. They're all even powers of x. So we have ourselves an even function. OK, here's the hard one. This is the one that I said at the beginning is one of the harder problems, I think, from the, from the text that I've seen so far. And so it's, it's determined if this function is even or odd. So we need to <coughs> plug in negative x. Now the question is, how do you simplify that? Maybe somewhere you know, in, in your mind, you've got tucked away that under odd roots, you can pull out signs. Right? Maybe somewhere you've got that tucked away. But why? Why can you do that? Now that's that's the question that I've that I struggled with before presenting this. But the before I get into that, when you simplify it that way, you take out that negative sign, um, you get one plus the third root of x. So there's no negative sign on that one now, right? This is just still plus one, but now the sign of this has been changed. The sign of everything hasn't been changed, just the sign of that one term. So this means we do not have our original function back, which means this is, this is not even. Is it odd? Well, for, for us to say that it is odd, what would we need to say? We would need to say that f of x equals negative f of x, which is 
negative 1 plus, or excuse me, 1 minus the third root of x, which equals minus 1 plus the third root of x. But that's not what we have either. So it's not even. It's not odd. It's neither. So there you go. Neither. Um, but I think the harder question is, why can you do this? Why can you do this step of just pulling the negative sign out of that? And so I think, <coughs> I think it boils down to you know quickly just looking at this third root of some negative number of some some negative x. So this this results in some number y. Okay. So the third root of something is some number y. And there's this relationship that y is the third root of this negative x if and only if when you cube y, you get negative x out. Okay, so now there's two situations that I see. I see that what if x is a positive number? And what if x is a negative number? What can we say about y? Well, if, if x is positive, then we have this this result that negative x is negative, which means that y must be negative as well. Right, so if x is positive, then y must be a negative number. Because you cube a negative number to get a negative number out. You can't cube a positive number to get a positive number out. Then we also have if x is positive, well then we know that y must be uh, positive as well. Excuse me, if y is negative, that means negative x is positive. That means that y must be positive as well. Because when you cube it, you get positive, negative, the positive of the opposite of x, right? Whatever that is, that number. Um, so from here, we can make sort of a, uh, sort of another argument. I'm going to erase the second case. It is exactly the same um, as this one without a sign involved. So here we have that y, we'll say that y is just really equal to negative a, where a is some positive number. So when you take y cubed, what do you get? You get negative a cubed, which is equal to negative 1, if I factor that out, cubed, times the positive number a cubed. But what is y cubed? y cubed is equal to negative x, right? That's how we defined it up here. If, if, if y is the cube root of negative x, then y cubed has to equal negative x. So this, this gives us this result, that negative x equals negative 1 cubed a cubed. Let's divide by this negative 1. Then we get x is equal to negative 1 squared, which is 1 times a cubed. Well, what is a cubed? Right? We can we can sort of now work our way back. A cubed is the opposite of y cubed. And we can piece it right back together. Okay? So that's where everything comes right back to the very beginning. We've now found that we've got this result. So cubed root of x, of negative x I should say, is equal to y. Okay, And <clears throat> we've just found through this relationship here that a cubed is equal to the opposite of y. Excuse me. Uh, it, we found this result here, that x is equal to the cube of a, which means that the cube root of x is equal to the cube root of a cubed, right? But this is equal to okay. So I'm just rewriting this line here: cube root of x from this last line that we found from before is equal to the cubed root of a cubed, which is just what? That's just a. 
But what is A? A is the opposite of Y. Okay. And here we see that now Y, if we just flip the sign over, the negative Q root of X is equal to Y. So what do we have from the very beginning? We have that y was the cubed root of negative x. And now we've just shown, in the case that the input is positive, that y is also equal to the negative of the cubed root of x. So we just showed that negative cubed root of x in this positive input case is equal to the cubed root of negative x. So that, that means that this is an odd function when you have positive input. So when you, when you have negative input, the proof is the same, but you're just going to have to deal with signs being in different places. So we'll, I'll, I'll leave that for you for another time. Uh, you, and you can work that out on your own. If you can work that out, I would say you're doing really, really well for yourself. Okay, so the next one is for uh, is just to do what I said I'd do earlier, and that's just to pick a random problem from this book and graph it. Uh, so here we go. Um, I don't know, problem 95, 96. Um, those, are, those are ugly. Let me take some of these graphing transformations. Here we go. Okay, 52 is the last one out of this section. 52 says to graph y equals 3 minus 2 times x minus 1 squared and I'm just I'm going to I'm going to do this rather quickly as I say things out loud so when I look at this um, I see a square function I see that it's been flipped because of that um, see it's been flipped because of that negative in, in front of it. And I see that it's been shifted by 3 because of that 3 minus the thing in the beginning. And I see that it's been shifted left or right because of that negative 1. So first I'm going to graph the parent function. So this is x squared. This is what it normally looks like. Okay. So the first thing is that we're going to flip it. That's because of this, this negative here in front. And the, we're also going to extend it up by 2. We're going to increase every height by 2. So if I were to do all of that in one fell swoop and shift it to the right by 1, here's what would happen. So we're going to take this, move it to the right 1, we're going to flip it, and we're going to increase its heights. So instead of getting 1, 1, we're going to get, we're going to plug in 1, and we're going to get negative 2. So here and here, we're at negative 2. So this is a graph of negative, negative 2 x minus 1 squared. And how do I get the final result? Well, I add 3 to it. So I lift this whole thing up 3. So here's the final, final, final result really quickly. There we go. It's negative 2 times x minus 1 squared plus 3. I'm going to write the 3 at the end because I can, because you can commute like that if you like. So that's it. Right? It makes graphing these things so quick and easy. All you have to know is the parent function, and you know how you have to know how these transformations affect the, the original graph. Um, it can be really that fast. So it just takes a little bit of practice. And a little bit of, a little bit of memorization of these basic uh, transformations and the parent functions, really knowledge of parent functions, absolute values, squares, square roots, cube roots, things like this. They're good to know. So with that, we're done with section 2.6, and I'll have another video here on 2.7 shortly. So I hope that helped, and uh, I'll see you for the next one. Until then. <laughs>